My name is Keith Stevens. I'm the founder of Quave, which is a secure collaboration suite. And we'll get to see some of Quave uh, later in this talk. But first, I'd like to introduce you to the core problem I would like to discuss, which is that the software industry has a dirty secret, and it's a bit embarrassing. I've advertised this talk as uh, how to grow a complex software suite uh, for the long run. Uh, and that sounds really respectable. But actually, we could also say that this talk is about fighting crappy code. And the problem is nobody wants to write crappy code. Nobody wants to work at a place where they need to fix a lot of crappy code. And certainly no clients want to buy software from a shop that seems to ship crappy code. So we use fancy euphemisms like technical debt. Imagine a world in which you are living and working, a world where a small change request is actually a small change, where instead of fighting against the grain, your code flows naturally, where the designs you're working with are not tripping you up with incorrect assumptions, where you get a lot done without a lot of stress. We all want to live in that world, right? A world where technical debt is under control and where you can work in the zone of flow and effortless productivity. In practice, of course, we experience friction. Things never work out quite the way we would expect. Developing new features seems to take like forever. The backlog is endless. Bugs are a fact of life. Firefighting happens all the time. It's obvious that the more complex a software system grows, the more moving parts you have, the harder it is to keep momentum moving forward. And that's what this talk is about. It's about how can we fix that or how can we keep that momentum as we grow the software. I'm going to show you a bit of what Quave is and the way we structured it because that's where I'm coming from and it gives like a concrete context for the things we're talking about here. Quave, like I said, is a secure community environment where people can communicate, they can collaborate on files together, which is basically a fancy way of saying that we ship a social internet. Quave will be 10 years old next month. The Quave suite consists of dozens of packages with many modules each. Uh, all of that sits on top of deeper frameworks that pull in hundreds of external dependencies. And to give you an idea of size, the application runner Docker image clocks in at more than two gigabytes. And I will talk in more detail about our architecture stack later. Let me show you the UI first, uh, just a quick whirlwind tour of, of some of the features that we have. These screenshots are taken from a design prototype, uh, which is a standalone mock-up of all our UI interactions. What you're seeing here is the portal dashboard with a prominent activity stream and a calendar uh, portlet. And we have many more portlets that are you know, below the fold here. And you can configure the dashboard uh, with that. We offer a wide selection of apps. I'm going to show you some examples. The contacts app gives you access to relevant information about each user in the system. Uh, people love this a lot. I mean, just you know, to find a, a phone number of, or an email address. You can also see in which groups a member is active. Uh, there's also tabs that I'm not screenshotting here that show you know, which documents this person worked on, they show you his activity stream. Yeah, basically the whole works. We have a calendar app which aggregates calendar events from across the system, and you can then subscribe on each of those uh, separate streams uh, in, your, in your favorite calendar application. We have a news magazine, which provides a central channel for the communications department to communicate with all employees. We have a library, which is a shared document repository, which is accessible for all employees. And I think the main uh, mainstay of uh, where people uh, do the work are workspaces, which are team oriented spaces where a group of people works on a set of documents. And these workspaces are really secure and each workspace can have its own security configuration. It has an activity stream. It has visual document previews. You can edit documents in place. You can read documents here. I mean, this is a Word document, but you don't have to open Word to read it. And you also don't have to open Word to edit it. You can do that with our online editor. And finally, we have a search, which is very visual, and which gives you access to everything in the system. And this is a faceted search. You can narrow down on, on file type or you know, document type. You can narrow down on time range, on tags. There's a number of facets you can use. So that's a lot of features. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. And everything I showed you was built and shipped. 
but our design prototype also contains new features that are designed but still need to be built. And the way we work, we always have design depth, which is also a form of technical depth if, if you want to see it that way. Because our design system is always ahead of the actual product that we ship. Let me give you some highlights of our roadmap. We are working on strengthening our Quave Cloud offering. And to make that happen, we need to support full self-service of all configuration options uh, through the admin app so that there's no, like, no need for us to do consultancy uh, to get people up and running and configure their, uh, their site. Additionally, we're working on an app store where you can select and activate add-on apps from the app ecosystem that we're growing. The point I'm making again is it's a lot, it's a lot uh, which means that we're never fast enough to, you know, to do the work that we want to do. On top of that, we're a distributed team with our team members spread across eight cities in six countries. Uh, and of course we had Corona uh, on top of that, but you know, we've been distributed since the get-go. Uh, and obviously that is a great thing uh, if you can work from home, but it also uh, introduces friction if you cannot uh, sync easily in person. So the tension between our ambitions on the one hand and the effort required to develop a chip product on the other hand can be quite stressful. If we want to speed up, you know, everybody wants to speed up. And this is where the uh, concept of tactical depth comes from. It's a way to express that, that tension we all feel between what we want to do and what's actually you know, the experience of development as we're working. Uh, technical depth is a respectable uh, term. It's a concept introduced by Ward Cunningham using a financial metaphor. And basically it says, we want to ship more features now than we can actually build properly. Uh, so instead of building it properly, we take shortcuts. And these shortcuts can be seen as a loan that we take out. Uh, it's something we need to pay back in the future. We need to pay back the loan. We need to remove the shortcuts and replace them with proper solutions. And until we do that, we will suffer from the nastiness that results from the shortcuts we've taken. And this nastiness is our ongoing interest payment. This is an interesting metaphor. It captures some of the aspects that, uh, you know, that, that are working here. And especially in a startup scene, of course, that sounds really like, okay, you can, you can use that metaphor. You know, it's far more sexy to say, you know, we took on technical debt than to say we, we shipped some really nasty code that we need to fix it up. But for me, the tech, term tactical debt is actually confusing and misleading. It sounds very rational when the process that happens doesn't feel that rational. The process that happens is like, we do not have enough time to do this properly and we need to ship this now. And the whole part about paying interest and planning future cleanups, that's mostly part dreams as if deadline pressure will be less next month. It, it never is. So I propose to redefine technical debt as crappy code, just crap code. What is crappy code? That's code that should be better. Most code can be better. Crappy code should be better. And the main effect of crappy code is that it slows you down. It introduces friction. Crappy code is difficult to understand. It's painful to change. You can think of crappy code as a glitch in the matrix. It's caused by a glitch in the matrix also, but let's not go down that particular rabbit hole. And I will use, keep using the term technical depth since it is well known and like I said, it sounds more respectable. As long as you and I know that technical depth, you know, when I'm using that word, I actually mean crappy code. It's useful to make a classification of technical depth into levels, which is like a reverse cap capability maturity level. Normally in the capability maturity level, the higher your level, the more mature you are. And here it's basically like, you know, the less mature you are. So on level one, we have managed technical debt. And this is the stuff that actually conforms to the original definition of tactical debt. You have some stuff that is suboptimal. You have a managed process of uh, fixing it up. Cleanups are planned, either as uh, a 25% maintenance task load per sprint, or perhaps as a dedicated maintenance sprint every two or three sprints, or every three or four. I've seen both models used in practice, and the model of maintenance sprints uh, worked out pretty well. It gives you a very clear focus if you're on a maintenance sprint, like, you know, we're replacing, we're refactoring that component, and we're not introducing new features at this stage. If you are at this level, good for you. You're working in a healthy environment. The next level is that of acceptable technical debt. When working on feature tickets, technical debt manifests as setbacks. You expect it to be able to do something in two days, and, you know, you stumble on something and you need to fix it up and 
takes all week to do uh, the whole uh, feature. We take it in your stride and do cleanups as you go. At least you do not leave stuff worse than you found it most of the time. I'd say this is a fair description of the state of play for most of the wave stack. When we need to do feature work on the part of the code base that has guarded some cobwebs, we modernize that part of the code base. And note that while there are five levels, and this is the second, this second level is actually the last level that you can consider healthy. Because the next level, level three, is that of toxic technical debt. When you're here, development is painful. Development effort is unpredictable. Shit happens all the time. You add layers of workarounds on top of all the workarounds since it's too hard to properly fix everything. And from here, it starts going downhill pretty fast. Level four is catastrophic technical death. Any change you make risks bringing down the whole house of cards. It feels really unsafe to do uh, ambitious development. Most time is spent on frantic firefighting. And at some stage, you slip from this level into the next level without even noticing. And you end up with a bankrupt system or a dead man walking. Rebuilding, you know, it's bankrupt because rebuilding the system from scratch would be cheaper than fixing it. And of course, there is no money to rebuild from scratch or you wouldn't have ended up in this hell to begin with. So you just stagger on hoping nobody notices at least for a while. And to be honest, I've worked in a lot of systems like this back in the days, you know, when we would build one of websites for customers for less money than we now budget for a feature edition. And you know, ending up in this place was part of the normal life cycle of a website. You build a site and then there is no money to maintain it. It runs fine, but it gets behind on versions. You make a few feature changes that match rather awkwardly with the older code. After two years, the client makes a major feature request, which is conceptually incompatible with what you have in your database and your code. You just stack it on top of that anyway. At least you want to, but you can't even get your development environment up and running anymore. So you sell the client the brand new site, which is in the end demotivating for everybody, which is why we now play a very different game. Still, even if you're not on level five, you still keep running into crappy code. You keep running into code that looks like a car wreck and you curse the guy who wrote that crappy code. What was he thinking? I call this the incompetent developer theory of technical debt, or more forcefully, the stupid code monkey theory. Of course, your colleagues think the same about your suboptimal code, uh, which doesn't really help team dynamics. It's a natural conclusion to, you know, to, to blame that, that on somebody when you're stumbling on crappy code, but it's not very productive. And it's also very myopic. It, it ignores a lot of the uh, dynamics that are in play that can explain why we actually have technical debt and how we can get a grip on that. So let's apply our analytic talents as developers in a more structured pattern to gain a deeper understanding of the forces that cause friction in software development. Here's a system model that illustrates some of the feed forward loops that result in crappy codes. And I'm going to uh, walk you through this uh, step by step. And you can think of this as the crappy code conspiracy. We'll start off with something that falls outside of the boundary of technical depth as traditionally defined, which is time, entropy, the simple passage of time, no conscious choice to make a shortcut, but still, after a while, your stack looks like this. As much as we try to freeze all dependencies, if you return after five years without doing maintenance, you cannot even do a build anymore. Upstreams have disappeared or upgraded. Downstreams like browsers have evolved and are suddenly incompatible with your older code. And even if you can get that stack up and running again, changing it is painful. You need to upgrade all dependencies. There is breaking framework changes coming in that you need to fix. Your tool chain is outdated and you know, you're not used to working that way anymore. Key business and design assumptions in the application are no longer valid or not fully valid, which means the world changed and your code did not. The client's business changed, the users changed, code patterns and conventions are now changed and stuff is outdated and developer understanding of that code that was there in the beginning was forgotten. And of course, you know, apart from all of that, uh, there's also security updates. So you need to keep, you know, you need to keep fixing your systems. So this is the place of entropy in the, in the systems model here. 
as systems degrade over time, it uh, the resist change more and more. This de decreases velocity. Also, the world keeps changing, so your architecture risks to become outdated. And that brings me to a main point, which is architecture, which is a major flex point of fixing technical debt or preventing technical debt. As software engineers, we naturally consider our architecture a dev concern. It's like breaking up a system into components, understanding it as a local building block, understanding relations between blocks, dependencies. That's the familiar strategy of divide and conquer, which we call high cohesion, loose coupling. Architecture provides well-defined boxes of logic, and this logic is business logic, and it's called business logic for a reason. It maps business concepts and processes into code. Business entities, business relationships, and business processes change over time, inevitably, and code has to map those changes. And if you get your architecture right, it provides a future-proof way of accommodating such changes, which you cannot foresee at the start, but still you can plan for accommodating them. Changes should be within, not across high cohesion blocks. Changes should rearrange, not rewrite loose coupling relationships. The software components should be able to follow business in a dance without stumbling. You can optimize your software architecture to be a natural expression of business domain entities, relations, and processes. And that's called domain driven design. And there was just an hour ago, there was a whole talk about domain driven design. I've also seen it come up in other talks in this uh, conference. And it's basically that the, the core concept there is that the, the terms you use in software development, what you name your component, actually would make sense to an end user. So you, you make a very tight conceptual coupling between what you do in your code and what happens out there in the world. And that guarantees that the changes in the world are relatively easy to follow with changes in the code without stuff breaking all over the place. The knowledge about this mostly resides with business, business analysts, but typically also to a large extent with design. Uh, whose, you know, design's job is to understand and work with the big picture of a client's business operations. So architecture, you can think of that as big picture code quality. It determines what is easy to change in a chunk. And the right architecture, like I said, they map naturally to real entities and processes. If there's a mismatch between your architecture on the one hand and incoming feature requests and changing business processes on the other hand, your architecture starts to act as a drag on velocity. New code doesn't fully fit the architecture and code quality suffers as a consequence. And the conceptual dissonance between what the architecture thinks the world is, you know, pretends that the world is, and what you're actually trying to do and changing your code, that starts to drain developer energy. As your product and business grow, you add more code to provide more features, which increases cognitive load, it increases maintenance burden, it increases dependency coupling, it increases resource requirements. In other words, the value stream that feeds your business also starts to act as a drag. By adding even more features, ever more features, complexity load increases. And because the stream of feature requests never dries up, there is always time pressure. We always want to ship more and ship it faster. Which brings us to time pressure. Shipping fast is calendar time, shipping cheaply is developer time. And we want to like speed up on both counts. And that's basically the business problem that you know the cost of the solution should be less, ideally way less than the benefits that it brings to our client. And the result of that is that we ship MVPs, minimally viable products, which generate benefits so that we can increase traction and that we can improve the next iteration or with the next client. And this again ties closely to the original concept of technical debt as you know, an investment or as a loan you take out and something that you need to fix in the future. Deadline pressure has negative effects on code quality. And this is, that's perhaps the key dynamic in this whole diagram. Time pressure also degrades the architecture because it becomes too easy to not update the architecture to changing business processes and design patterns. And finally, deadline pressure directly degrades developer joy. As a result of all these pressures, code quality suffers. Compromises and half-baked features proliferate. And that's the key challenge in technical debt. We ship more bugs and less complete features. Your velocity goes down as friction increases. As the system gets less elegant, developers develop, uh, experience more stress. And this now triggers the loop of doom. Decreasing code quality acts as a drag on value and on velocity. Decreased velocity slows down value delivery even more. 
the less value you ship, the less money you can invoice, the bigger the pressure is to ship fast, to ship fast. And you know, it's an increasing pressure. Increased time pressure leads to more code quality compromises, and so the loop continues. Entropy and architecture mismatch and time pressure, they all conspire towards this experience of friction. They're trying to make a small change, but first need to fix tooling breakage. Everything starts you know, to become slow and down the hole you go. Meanwhile, a more private hole is also growing. Burnout. As a developer, the more time pre pressure you experience, the more stressed you get. Beyond some threshold, your productivity suffers. As your productivity suffers, time pressure increases. Meanwhile, your code quality is also degrading. Your architectural contributions are also degrading. And in turn, each of those degradations, they sap more energy. And the paradox is that this all feels like a very personal failure. You're not up to the pressure of the job and you're, you're, you're not doing your job right. But at the same time, the dynamic appears to be beyond your personal control. So this is truly paralyzing and this is what's, what's you know, risk causing burnout. Well, that's some heavy stuff that I, uh, that I went over in a, in a fast pace. I described a lot of self-reinforcing feedback loops come bad. But the thing is those same loops work in your favor if you invest in improving quality. If you can find a entry point to ease the burden, that's a positive effect that will propagate across this causal network. Development friction will ease everywhere if you make just a single positive change somewhere. So let's take a breath and look at how to achieve positive outcomes. I'm going to switch gears and show you some of the factors that I think can contribute, of that have contributed to the success of Quave. And maybe you could find some inspiration there in you know, where you can find levers to, uh, to, to ease that uh, technical debt dynamic in your own uh, practice. We can summarize that whole complex systems and dynamics model that I just showed into a simple statement. It's not just about the technology or even stronger. Crappy code is a process failure, much more than it is a technology failure. Technology is a necessary but insufficient condition for high quality software production. The other side of the coin are agile processes and high value delivery. Let's look at the ways that we keep technology and process in sync at Quave and what we are doing to improve that. So first off, you need to have your foundations right. And uh, one of our first uh, foundations is the product vision. Uh, I wrote a book uh, when we started Quave, which outlined the full vision of the product that we wanted to ship. Um, it's called Digital Workplace Technology Roadmap. And this is basically a theory of change. How can social technology support organizational change? It's based on extensive literature, research in the fields of collaboration systems and knowledge management. And all of that is then integrated into a cohesive roadmap. Uh, describing an integrated technology platform to support that design change. And even if the product you are working on does not have a white paper like that, in all likelihood, it still has an implicit theory of change. What change does your product make? For whom? And how does it make that change happen in the business? I mean, I'm not talking about the technology itself here. I'm talking about what is the effect on, on the client's business? What is the key focus or factor of change? What are the implied trade-offs that you're making and focusing that way? And clarifying the answers to those questions will, will help to clarify confused goal. A second foundational aspect, and we touched on that already uh, earlier in the talk, is having a really good architecture. And it cannot be overemphasized how critical this is. It's a, you know, the whole system of your application should be understandable, compartmentalized, properly dependency managed, and it should closely map to real world processes and entities. And that's the domain driven design angle that I emphasized before. So let me show you how the uh, Quave uh, stack is uh, built up. In this diagram, you can see our, you know, like our deployment stack with a front end uh, going to a load balancer, balancing across application servers, and then you know, several back end uh, database and supporting services, uh, powering all of that. And then the application server, it consists of Quave, but Quave is built on top of Plone. And Plone is you know, way older than Quave is. And Plone is built on top of Zoop, which is even older. And you know, we have hundreds of Python X altogether, and that sits on top of Python, and it sits on top of the operating system. 
Uh, we get a lot of features from Plone. Uh, Plone has a really strong security model with uh, role-based access controls, workflows. We have content types, and the primitives of, the, of that are provided by Zol. So we really love working in this system. And then we can split out Quave, like Quave itself consists of dozens of packages again. We bundled those into a mono repo core, most of them. Uh, we still have some, add, you know, also have some add ons, uh, Quave app add ons. And this, and this executes on the domain driven design principle by having packages that map to real world experiences there. And what the user calls a document should not be slightly different from the system component that represents that. And typically, you know, language is a, is a trigger where you can detect whether your domain model is correctly mapped into code objects. And finally, within each package, we have like a semi-fixed uh, structure which implements the ZOLP component architecture, which gives us a unified way of separating uh, the, uh, the data model, which is, you know, our content, our event streams, and then we have our view logic in browsers, and then we have our templates, which basically render the view logic into HTML. We have a standalone design prototype, which basically provides what you would call the controller in MVC uh, parlance. And we take fully articul articulated markup from the design prototype and we hook it up with our models and the templates. And the design markup already contains all the Ajax injections that tie the application as a whole together. And we also take bundles of JavaScript and CSS. They are already provided by the prototype. So we don't have to build those uh, in our application stack again. The value of having such a full live design reference system is hard to overstate. The design prototype is component-based itself. It's a complete design system. It covers all of our features. So we don't have throwaway design drawings that are outdated after a sprint and that are different between features. And whatever feature that you are working on in our stack, there's an up-to-date design reference available for you. And it, you know, it just works and it simulates all the user interactions. It demonstrates all the Ajax calls it provides the exact HTML markup and that you don't deviate from. There's no need to code CSS because that's already there in the resource package. And that's just the developer, the developer perspective of working uh, that way. From a business perspective, this is a great sales tool. We can demonstrate and sell a new feature in a realistic way before actually building it. And from a user perspective, the product we ship feels like a seamless whole, and that's because it is designed as a seamless whole. I'm noticing a lot of people talking about HTMX nowadays or HTMX, but we've been doing that for 10 years with PatternsLib. <clears throat> PatternsLib is our JavaScript library, which encapsulates all JavaScript into reusable patterns. And they can be called from HTML markup using pseudo CSS. And Plone has the same thing. It's called, it's called mockup there. And this provides some major benefits for us. Uh, and like I mentioned, you know, we have this standalone prototype that is fully operational, at least, you know, in terms of user interactions, there's no database hookups, but you know, all user interactions are there. We can test JavaScript integrations and develop them without firing up our complete stack. And we can just take all JavaScript, CSS and markup from the design and hook them up in our, uh, in our actual product. Let's shift gears a bit. And you know, there's, of course, the technical aspect of tooling. And that's what we easily focus on as developers if we're talking about fixing design depth or speeding up or you know, improving processes. And that's the whole thing about continuous integration, continuous development, the whole DevOps thing, having linters, having automated upgrades. I'm skipping those aspects because like, they're really important and they're foundational. But it's, I don't think that's what the bottle bottleneck is. I think the bottleneck is that crappy code is a process failure more than an engineering failure. And it's on the soft capabilities side. Shipping better code requires team level soft skills improvements. And that has to do with newer diversity, uh, which is a fancy way perhaps of saying that software developers are often people who are more comfortable with computers than they are with other people, which is a shame because exactly the, this diversity that we have in ways of thinking is a great asset. And we should bring together dwarves that code with elves that design. But unfortunately, those worlds are not that easily bridged. So in our, you know, in our way of working, we have this developer. This is the developer perspective where we have sprints, where you know, business and the PO is in business. 
has a backlog, manages the backlog for development, development plan, plans its print. Basically design, you know, you get design and you ship product to users. The design perspective is different. Design has its own Kanban managed uh, design process where like business has a roadmap, design implements that roadmap and we iterate on that in our design prototype. And design says, okay, let's look at users. From a design perspective, development is a black box. You, you put in design, you get out product, you give the product to your users. And of course, the product owner who is in business, he needs to bridge those two worlds of design and development, which don't fully overlap. And that's painful. And ideally, and that's what we are trying to work towards, the whole team functions as an integrated whole. Development understanding, you know, so that, but that means that as a developer, you need to understand design and business considerations. And also design needs to understand development considerations, even if they don't want to because you can only find good solutions if you bridge those worlds effectively. As a developer, that means you need to step out of your comfort zone and look beyond the code. You need to communicate and communicate more and be curious about non-engineering perspectives right, that, that are contributed by design and business. And don't just focus on reviewing a diff, but also on, you know, is the resulting code more elegant as a whole and does it, does it map to our design vision and our, our business roadmap? You need to actively engage with the design and business to understand this whole picture of how the company is creating value. And the payoff of doing that, funnily enough, will be better code, but also a more pleasant development experience. The goal is to build trust and collaboration across the whole team to integrate diverse viewpoints and disciplines so that dwarves and elves can ride together. As a first step, to do this again, we will do a co-located development sprint in the Alps in May. It's been years since we physically met up after two horror, long, horrible COVID years. It's going to be great to meet up again and code together again and you know work together as a team and boost team spirit. So let me quickly summarize what we went over. I'm almost out of time. The goal is not to be perfect because we are not and that's not realistic, but it is a feasible goal to be improving continuously. Technical depth is driven by complex systems dynamics. And without solid foundations, you will be overwhelmed by technical depth in the long run. CI and CD is necessary, it's, it's inf insufficient. Fighting technical depth through better engineering faces diminishing returns. Crappy code is a process failure, much more than a technical failure. And we need to focus on soft skills improvements to, uh, to move towards high quality code and architectures that match business and design requirements and the evolution thereof. To code high quality software, you need to continuously realign engineering with business and design. Thanks for that.